Mics are now live. <laughs> Hello, everybody. There's still some interesting background noise. Hello, everybody. We're back for Telescope Talk Pro, our, I guess we're bi-weekly now with this uh, hangout, We've ch the way things have changed for 2019. And um, my name is Tony Darnell from deepastronomy.space. And today's hangout, we're going to be talking with people from the Planets Foundation. Now, you guys rem probably remember them, but I'll reintroduce them anyway. We did a, a, a hangout series for many months called the ExoLife Hangout, where we talked about life in the universe and, and what we're going to need to find life in the universe, what kind of telescopes we're going to need, and all that kind of stuff. And we did that uh, for several months, and then we just sort of had to go our own ways because of because – of, um, differing schedules and things like that. So we're back with that team. We're going to get an update about the ExoLife Telescope. Now, if you don't know what that is, you're going to learn all about that this hour because it is a really great initiative that I've been very excited about, sort of obliquely involved in in whatever way I can help. And I, I just love these guys. So let me go ahead and bring them up. Somebody has got a lot of noise coming out of their mic. And I don't know what that is. So we may have to systematically mute you guys. <laughs> All right. Well, here's our panel. Okay. I don't hear it now. So there. Okay. In the lower, right below me in our little scientific Brady Bunch is Dr. Jeff Kuhn from the University of Hawaii. He's also a member of the Planets Foundation. Right next to me over, I knew I'd do that. Over here is Svetlana Berdugana. She is also a member of the Planets Foundation. And down there is Kevin Lewis. Guess what? Also from the Planets Foundation. So welcome back, guys. It's so good to see you. How are you guys doing? Thank you. It's really great to be back. We are we're a good team with you, we uh, hope so. I do, yeah. I, I love talking to you guys. We talk about really great things, and we talk about really interesting topics. And I want to remind everybody that we are, now that we're back in 2019, doing these Hangouts on a regular basis, we are streaming on YouTube, Twitter, Twitch, and what's the other one? Uh, Facebook. Oh, yes, I'm on Facebook on the OPT Telescope page, which reminds me, these Hangouts are sponsored and endorsed by the uh, by OPT Telescopes, a world leader in telescopes and accessories for amateurs and professional astronomers. They, have, they are a great shop. They're located in California. They ship worldwide. So if you need a telescope or if you're interested in getting into the hobby of amateur astronomy, please check them out. Also check out our weekly podcast that I do with them called Space Junk, and you can get, you can uh, listen to that podcast anywhere podcasts can be heard because we syndicate to all the things. So th please check out our podcast as well. We just did one with Fraser Kane uh, last week, and we are going to tomorrow. We're going to be talking with the president of Mead Instruments. So that'll be a good hangout as well. I mean, a good uh, podcast as well. Okay. So the Exo Life Telescope. Who wants to give us a summary of what it is, Svetlana? Okay. It's ExoLife Finder Telescope. What, what did I say? ExoLife Telescope. Okay, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't finish it, did I? Okay. <laughs> yes, ExoLife Finder Telescope or ELF. We call it ELF. Right. So little ELF, one of the <laughs> biggest telescopes, but little ELF. <laughs> and, uh, it's designed uh, to find life in the universe, which is ExoLife we call and uh, yeah. So we, I guess, we will talk about it today. I'm. Uh, working mainly on science cases for ExoLife Finder Telescope, and maybe Jeff, who is inventor of it can, and designer of it, can say about technical things. Now, while you're talking, I'm showing the animation, so that's up and being broadcast. Okay, guys. So just so you know, um, and uh, so th this telescope, it looks enormous, and it's got all this ring of mirrors around it. Who wants to talk about that design? I could do that. Yes. Um, so. Yeah, so where to begin? So so this group, the Planets Foundation, came together, its engineers and scientists, to um, address this question of, do we have the technology now to be able to afford and, and build an optical instrument? It's, it's, it's quite a bit different than, than the other large telescopes being built to, to do what's called direct imaging. So now that we know that most stars have planets and maybe half of them or a quarter of them have planets that could have liquid water on them, there's, there's a growing feeling that 
we can learn about life, maybe even life here, by looking for life in this sort of cosmic ecology that we're likely to be part of. To do the direct imaging takes a, a telescope that is is really designed for that problem. Um, so the exoplanetary world here on Earth, the scientists and the public that care deeply about this problem of learning about our cosmic ecology need uh, an instrument that is is dedicated to that problem. And it's different than the other big telescopes that astronomers are building. Those are telescopes that are designed to look out and, and into the most distant parts of the universe. Um, and in, in general, they're not, they're not very good. They're not optimized to be able to see the faint light and the signals that come from uh, what we call an exoplanet, a planet around another star. So starting a few years ago, um, this group with some funding from a wealthy individual was was tasked with the question of if you were going to if you're going to design a telescope that's specifically there to look for signs of life on exoplanets, how would you do it? And that's that the output of that was a telescope that we called Colossus at the time, um, and um, and that is a half a billion dollar telescope. During the time that this group has been working on this problem, we discovered that Proxima Cent B, um, the, the nearest star, had a had a exoplanet around it, which probably had liquid water or could have liquid water. And so we asked or we tasked ourselves with the question: Well, what would it take to look at the the, the very nearest exoplanets, the very nearest stars, to see signs of of life? Now. It turns out that Proxima b is a very red star. It's not a star like the sun. And so it changes, it changes the ball game for finding life signals on planets and for finding exoplanets or looking at the exoplanets. And that's where ELF comes from. ELF is smaller than Colossus. ELF um, is not exactly what, what we would use to, uh, to do a census for life in, in our part of the, the galaxy. But um, it, it, is, uh, it is a telescope that would very nicely look at Proxima, Proxima Sen and look at an exoplanet around it. And it does it by combining these elements in optics of, of a big telescope, like the biggest single dish telescope is a telescope like Subaru or Gemini. It's got an eight meter mirror. It's as big a mirror as you can make out of a single piece of glass. In those cases, it's a pretty thick piece of glass. Or Keck, which is a bunch of small mirrors, to get a mirror which is 10 meters across. Um, neither one of those telescopes is particularly good at, at looking. Neither one of them will be able to see um, a planet around the nearest star. ELF could, and, and that's, what it's, that's what it's designed to do. And it does it by 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 this ring of mirrors being combined in a, in, a, in a way that we call interferometry, makes an image that is really good at controlling what we call scattered light. So the bright light of, of, the, of the central star, which is 10 million times or a million times brighter than the, the light that's reflected off of the exoplanet. The glare created by that in the telescope doesn't obscure the light from 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 the exoplanet, and and that's something that no other telescope telescopes historically are designed to have a lot of collecting area, uh, and that's so you can see faint things and you can see very far away. But they're not designed specifically to to control the glare of something bright next to something very very faint, and and that's what that's what's special about Elf and the way it's designed, and why why it will be the, the instrument to go off and, and, and do, do studies of the atmospheres and, and the reflected light from exoplanets. So, uh, Jeff, there is a ring of these primary elements all around the, uh, the, the collecting area that are off-axis to the 
point that it reflects to in the in the secondary. And from previous hangouts, I know that that each one of those elements has its own secondary mirror at the top of that tower. Correct? Yeah. Yeah. So in, in some ways, it's this it's this telescope, which is a collection of telescopes, and it's this kind of a scalable design where the primary and the secondary mirror are all combined in a in a single mount to create at the center back at the um, so so the light comes to a, a they're off axis the pieces of a parabola so if you were to draw the, the geometric surface that includes all of those mirrors it would be a parabola and each one of those circular segments which is about five meters across right so it's about it's about 15 15. 15 feet across each one of them. So they're each control, they're oh. controllable in a way that gives us something, gives us a telescope that doesn't weigh very much. It doesn't have to be very stiff, so it doesn't have to be heavy. Um, and it, it has this potential, a, a part of the telescope is, is itself to be what, uh, what astronomers call a coronagraph. We control the light and how it interferes with itself at the level of the telescope. So, once the light is combined in a convention like the, the 30 meter telescope or the Keck telescopes, there's a single secondary for all of those mirror segments that combines the light. But once it's already combined, the scattering properties of the telescope are built into what, what we have to fix to see the exoplanet. In the ELF telescope, we use the telescope itself to control the light before it ever gets inter, intermixed and before it the glare is produced that obscures the exoplanet from the star. So each one of those mirrors is part, you could think of it as a separate telescope, sending its light down uh, into a central area down below all of that uh, optical elements and, and things like that. And what, and you said earlier that this is a, um, th this is an, special use telescope, meaning that when you design things like Keck or uh, the Blanco four meter or whatever telescope it is on the ground these days, they tend to be able to, they tend to be optimized for certain wavelengths like the optical or maybe the infrared or whatever it might be, but they can do and look at different science cases, different objects in order to do different kinds of science with it. Like you might look at nebulae or you might also look at distant galaxies all using the same telescope. But this, the ELF, the ExoLife Finder telescope, is designed specifically for looking for signatures or looking directly at exoplanet. You're not inferring the exoplanet by a wobble or by a spectrum shift. You're looking directly at the planet using something yeah. I think you said called interferometry. Yeah, it's 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 um Let's see, you had a bunch of comments in your, in your question. I see well, it wasn't a question. There. I was just trying to summarize what you said yeah. in another way and then yeah. maybe ask you about interferometry because one of the things I, that I have a hard time picturing is this idea that, okay, we know the star is very bright compared to the reflected light of the planet. So how does interferometry work to get rid of that? And if, okay. it's, it so, might, so might, might be hard really, to explain. You made a really important point and what distinguishes ELF from other telescopes is is we use that light from the star. So we'll always, in our field of view, which is tiny, it's just a little tiny piece of the sky that we look at around the star. We use the light from the star to control, we say the wavefront, to control the telescope, um, uh, in some ways the telescope structure. So the telescope adjusts, that mostly the secondary mirrors, but also the primary mirrors are very thin. And, and that electronic adjustment is what allows us to not have a whole bunch of mass, um, which makes things expensive. We've replaced it with, with the technology of, of information processing. Because we require that bright star to make the telescope do what it does, we won't be looking at um, distant quasars or distant galaxies. Um, so it doesn't we, work very well for very faint we things. Possible if we had the right laser guide star, but it's very complicated for this telescope to do that. To make a laser to make a, the bright star, we're 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 focused like a laser on on the mm -hmm. idea of finding the light of exoplanets scattered. I, do you want to do you want to respond to Hans? Hans is as I see some chat questions that came. Up yeah, there. if you see something you want to respond to, go ahead. I'm just trying to get. I want to get understanding interferometry though, so don't forget to go back to that. What's yeah. Hans Milling asking? He's a great uh, 
a viewer. Hans, Hans, Hans was asking first about making power with the telescope, just as because he, it's a solar concentrator, but it's not cost effective. And the okay, and, and remember, we're looking at tiny, tiny, infinitesimal amounts of power from the exoplanet. So the the design and the engineering are, are all very different. Yeah, but if you looked at the sun with it, could you do it? <laughs> That would, be, <laughs> that, that would be a, a really. Um, that would not be good. Okay. Um, so the dome for this is also interesting. Yeah, the dome is an important part. Well, if you're reading the, questions, the then say who it is. Who who's questioning? Okay, Hans, Hans is asking. Oh, oh okay. About, All right. Is is about Hans Milling? I love these guys because I don't have to do my part. Go for it. Well, I don't. <laughs> I popped up on my screen. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. So so um so Hans the 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 idea of the dome is so so this is doesn't require the sort of stiff keck like structure of the 30 meter telescope so one design is doesn't actually have a dome it just it we lower the central pier down to the ground and then we we fold over some covers um and then uh during operation it comes up out of those covers and we have maybe a wind fence around the outside of it to to decrease the, the wind pressure on, on the optical structure and the time frame for funding to the funding is not in place we have a few actually a few millions of dollars now that are going to some of the technology um, it could be built within five to ten years if we got somebody that said here's uh, the cost of building the elf in the version we see is probably about 50 between 50 to 100 million dollars um, i think 50 million dollars would build the telescope that would look at proxima uh, prox prox and b um and and if if you're that that person um, um talk to us we'd love to you know. yes in part we do this handouts to hope that somebody uh who is interested in astronomy has enough money to sponsor our project so please pass the information pass the idea that we want to detect exolife and we know how to do it and we have the best telescope to build to do it well, let's talk about that a little bit then, while we're on the topic then, because you guys have social media ways of getting funding into the project too. And this is a way, while it may not be enough to fund the telescope directly, and that may not be what you're you know, uh, expecting to, to be able to raise, you can show that there is community support for it and things like that. So what, and maybe Kevin, this is a question for you, what kinds of things are you doing that these guys can get involved in with regard to the Exo Life Finder Telescope and the Planets Foundation in general to just keep this project going and alive? Yeah, so uh, we've launched a couple of Kickstarters, uh, mainly to raise overall support for what we're doing, raise awareness, and also uh, raise money for some of the technology. So about a year, year and a half ago, we launched a couple of Kickstarters. And, um, and they were pretty successful, weren't they? Yeah, they were. They were successfully raised like 35000 on one of them, 45000 on the other. And again, that went towards uh, some technology development for the Planet Smear and also some um, ELF technology. So in addition to kind of the traditional Kickstarter gifts like hats and t-shirts, we created these products to engage people a little bit deeper with what we're doing. So um that was really well received. People love these uh, extra gifts. One of them was called Exo Cube. It was actually, I have it here. Yeah, I have one too. Yeah, it's a, probably a little bit hard to see, um, but this is a map of nearby exoplanets that are potentially uh, habitable. Earth is in the center. Yeah, 3D, 3D space, like a piece of space uh, illustrating where the planets are, which we will hope to find life on. Yes. Um, and then we also launched another one called Cosmic Lights. And uh, let's see. Let me turn off my light. Hang on one second. Okay. And while you're doing that, so, that, so there is a... Um, there is a web page, planets.life, that you can go to where a lot of this stuff is is updated on a continual basis so you can get involved in whatever way you that's appropriate for you. But these guys are really trying to build this telescope from the ground up. And there, I don't think, uh, Jeff and Svetlana, there's a lot of like NSF support or government support involved in this, is there? Or not is yet, there? Not yet. <laughs> Maybe well, not this... like us, because we, we included, uh, we, we did uh, white papers and we did review on techno signatures. NASA was interested uh, recently and we included ELF also in those papers. So maybe at some point NASA is interested. Okay. So, um, 
we created these uh, lights that was, I was just showing you the, the Voyager plaque. And then kind of the new evolution of this is something that I've designed called Starlights. And this is a LED night light, mostly targeted for kids. And I love it for a lot of reasons, um, but mainly is because it, it, the idea is to engage kids further with astronomy. So you can see there is the Little Dipper, Big Dipper, Cassiopeia. So in addition to, you know, it being an actual nightlight that's functional, um, they can learn a little bit more about the stars and the universe around them. So uh, this is still in development, but I have a website called getstarlights.com where you can sign up and um, sign up for updates to, to see when we actually launch these, but uh, these are still in development. Yeah, and I have up the uh, Starlights banner that you sent as well as um, um, there's a, Here's a, there's another one um, with, uh, I think you call it Starlight Sailor Flyer. And it, yes. it looks like a, a, there's a boat in the, in the foreground with several constellations up. And these are beautiful. These are really great. So, yeah. So, this is something. So, these will be available soon. And the proceeds to this goes to help Planets Foundation in some way. Yeah, exactly. It goes directly to uh, help support our technology and um, the operations around, around all that. Okay. So, there's several phases it looks like there's the general public awareness which we're working on now there's also you know then there's general public support in whatever ways crowdsourcing crowdfunding we can get uh to get the word out that it's here and then that will hopefully generate enough excitement in the donor class to get uh get some some money to build this telescope do you have an idea and maybe you said but i was busy pushing buttons uh what this thing is expected to cost guys the elf the exo life finder telescope yeah, Jeff said it. Uh, oh, he did. Okay. Million, at least, yeah. Fifty million. Okay. And mm -hmm. do you and the site for it is it expected to be in Hawaii or somewhere else? Well, we hope to have it in Chile since our target is in Alpha Sen. <clears throat> okay. Um, okay. So I want to get back to this interferometry idea, and then Svetlana, I want to ask you a little bit about some of the science that you're going to be able to do because <laughs> I got to tell you, it's very exciting what you're doing. So the the individual we've shown that I'm going to show this uh, animation again. This is the uh, the the telescope that is going. E there, how many elements are on the ring there, guys? So, so the total number of, of elements is is a is variable. Oh. Uh, but for it to work, there's a magic uh, a magic relationship that needs an odd number of uh, circular mirror segments. Around um, around the diameter that can be adjusted. So, as the as and so what we're in the process of, of raising uh, a million or so to build a prototype with this it would have a, a, a diameter of uh, maybe two meters. Um, and in all cases, the the problems of creating the imaging controlling the scattered light get easier when there's an odd number of, of mirror segments around the perimeter for complicated technical reasons. So, All right, so you so can that, tweak those. That, that image um, doesn't have an odd number. It was it was done for graphic reasons. Okay. But um, it, it should have 15 mirror segments. All right. Well, okay. Now, the reason... So each one of those uh, light paths follow a, a, a predetermined... Uh, a path for it to get down to the instrumentation and you're using interferometry to directly image this planet and the reason i'm so interested in this is because this is also what the event horizon telescope is doing at different wavelengths okay they're using radio telescopes from around the planet to combine the signals into a sort of pseudo earth-sized telescope to directly image the event horizon of sagittarius a star so right. how so do you do that? How does you have an interferometer looks at the interference patterns of all of these different light paths, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, well, okay. So if you imagine you had a single mirror, the light from different parts of the mirror is interfering to create that image that has the resolution, the ability to see fine detail in the final image. So a, a, a regular mirror is also interfering the light. Now, the Event Horizon Telescope is taking a bunch of radio telescopes all over the, the globe, and it's getting a single detector. It's only a single point 
um, and it's measuring the phase uh, at a single at a single pointing direction. And they're all pointing in this in roughly the same direction. It's actually over the over the beam of those telescopes, which has some width. But but what comes out of each of those is a measure of the of the think of it as a graph of the electric field fluctuating at very high frequencies. And they have it from all of them. And now, and now they don't have to link the telescopes physically because they have this record of the electric field going up and down. And they can take the electric field from each of the telescopes and they can, in the computer, they can shift them around until they find out how they're, how they're phased. Now, as the earth rotates and they see different pieces of the sky, they can create a picture, very, very small number of pixels, but a picture of a very small region of space around around these black holes, and it's interferometry because they're 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 changing in the computer, they're changing the 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 sort of the signal fluctuating in time until it matches and until they line up, and when they line up, they know that the electric field has both information about the atmosphere is different and, and there are different locations. And so the propagation time is different. The distance to, to the black hole is different from those telescopes. And all of those effects are removed in the computer after the fact. That's interferometer. That's how, that's how the, the VLA works. That's how all the radio interferometers work. They each are separately pointed and the signals are combined usually after the fact. but but some optical, well, in an optical interferometer, we don't have the luxury of being able to record the electric field because it happens, the frequencies are too fast. So we have to analog combine them. We can't do it in a computer. And in, a, in, a, um, in, a, in most interferometers, those signals are combined. And uh, so the Keck interferometer, for example, has, a, has, a, has an analog system that takes the light and it adds it together in a detector and it, and it, and it produces, it has like a trombone slide that varies the delay in the same way that the computer could slide the signals back and forth to match them. But in, in, in an optical interferometer, there's a delay line. It's very complicated, it's very expensive and it doesn't actually produce, it's not combining many points in the sky at the same time. That's called a physo interferometer when you can take images and you can and you can combine the electric field of the images all overlapping. And, and so we're doing interferometry in, in L for Colossus by taking the complete image of each one of those telescopes, laying it on top of all the other images. So the electric fields are adding up in our image detector in this analog way. And we we create the delay like like the, um, the event horizon telescope does in the computer by shifting signals back until they match, or like an optical interferometer does it with a big uh, slide, think of a trombone slide that changes the path uh, of the light by an amount. That's, that's the Keck system. In our system, we take all of the light from each of the telescopes, the light point by point in the images combined, and then that secondary mirror does a little bit of adjustment to do the shifting of the signal to make it phase properly. Phase properly just means that right, there's a delay introduced by the atmosphere, same thing is true in ELF. The path through the atmosphere is slightly different and the structure is kind of floppy. And so the, to get the path length right, that secondary mirror for each one of the sub apertures, each one of the those elements, separate elements on the ring, um, it does the interferometry. So in ELF, we, we do two things. One, we, we, the, the, the path lengths or differences are tiny. They can be done with a secondary mirror and we do it in a complete image. So the whole image all at once is, is creating um, an inter, interferometric pattern. Right, because you're looking at that star, let's say, you know, Proxima Sen or whatever it is, you're looking at that star and you're getting the entire thing. And then these. We, we, are, we can use the information of that bright star to help us um, phase all of those 15 mirror segments. Um, in the case of the Event Horizon Telescope, they're also using um, the radio signal uh, that, that comes from the central object in the computer 
to slide things around to, to see where they match. So basically it's a puzzle, interferometry is a puzzle. You have a signal versus time that looks like a wave and it, its amplitude is changing and you wanna find where, that, where it matches with, with another signal and you have to slide it back and forth. That means producing a delay, a relative delay between those two signals. In the case of in the case of the event horizon telescope, it's done on the computer. And in that and in that phasing, I'm sorry, I just want to make sure I get it before you go too far. That phasing is what will eventually get you the image of the planet. Am I am I getting this right? You're phasing each of these uh, secondary mirrors in such a way that the planet reveals itself. Yes. Yes. So by 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 adjusting how they overlap we can make a dark spot in our image where the light of the star goes away. We can make a dark spot so the light of the star goes away. And if there's a planet there, that comes out, that reveals itself. And that's why it's called a coronagraph. That's yeah. that's amazing. Okay, I think I finally get this. So, I mean, I, I just can never understand an interferometer. So with by facing this, these all of these beams together, you're canceling essentially the light from the star leaving behind the planet reflected light because it's at a slightly different phase. And well, fa it's at a different angle in the sky. Which and a different angle in the sky, but also a di slightly different phase because it's reflected light, right? It's polarized. And yeah. you can do things with that light that uh, now that you've isolated, it's a way of isolating all those photons so that you only left with the, the, uh, the, planet itself oh man that's awesome i'm sorry i just i when i when i, when I understand something i get really excited that's okay good now we've we so, and you say it works better with an odd number of these elements uh yeah that that's yeah that's a technical reason so there's a bunch of computer stuff that has to happen to identify the light from the star from from each of the sub apertures and it turns out we can identify that if there's an odd odd number because and it's, that explains cold. why you can't use it for anything else. I, I love that. Okay, that's why you're well, you're looking. Well, be careful, be careful. You, you could use it for anything that has a bright star. <laughs> and you want to see a dim thing next to it. Stars. Yes, yeah. okay. And, and, and if you want to see the star, in fact, you can, once you have it phased up, we can we can make exquisite observations of, of that bright object at, at the center. Thank you, Jeff. And thank you guys for bearing with me on this. I hope you learned something with that because I really wanted to understand that. And so thank you, Jeff, for taking the time to give us that little you, extra you, drill you down. take a question from LD Productions class? No, mate, forget them. This is about me now. I, I'm here okay. and I'm doing things. I don't, I don't care about these guys, of course. Yes, I'm kidding, of course. LD Productions class, go ahead. Do you want me to read it? Uh, I don't, uh, yeah, please read Okay, it. could this tech be applied to the next gen of space-borne telescopes? Oh, here you go. You've got, don't get them started on, okay, so on space is, telescopes. All right, so, but, all right, so but this is important. The, <laughs> the exoplanet problem, right, imaging problem, is going to be done from the ground before it's done from space. The cost of putting the same size system in space is about a factor of what? What would you say, Tony? A hundred? Yes, easy. If I took a telescope on the ground of a certain size and a certain performance. I'd say more than that, actually. Yeah, it's a lot more. Um, the cost of putting it in space is a hundred times that. For, for a now, given aperture, it's, it goes exponential with certain, with if you're going to go nuts yeah, with aperture. Yeah, so. Okay. so so the, the problem of, of finding life, okay, and so here's, here's, here's a really important point, right? In our generation, well, in the next 20 years, we will find alien life. It will happen. And it's not going to happen in space. It's going to happen from the ground because the, the cost to do it on the ground is a hundred times less. This problem depends on size. Um, th there's a, it's what we call a, a, a scaling relation, which says that the sensitivity to finding these signals gets better, like the aperture to the fourth power. So that means that, that, that a telescope, which is eight meters, can only see at, at maybe, maybe one system in, in space and get some of these signals. If you double the size, you have 16 times the sensitivity. Now, once we have the ability to phase and do interferometry, there's no advantage in space. The advantage in space is that the atmosphere blocks some of the light, so we can't look at very short wavelengths, and there are certain parts of the infrared that are blocked. 
But as long as we don't need those wavelengths, once we build telescope systems that are that are, are, are diffraction limited, we say, which means that the phase is controlled, there's no advantage to space. In fact, there's a huge disadvantage, which is this enormous cost. So um, prepare for aliens. It's going to happen in your lifetime and it's going to happen from the ground. Okay, well, that's a good segue into Svetlana because let's say Svetlana, the, the telescope is built. ELF is up there. It's, 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 it's gathering photons. It's using its interferometry. You've done some work on what to expect from ELF, haven't you? In other words, what can we see? What will we look, what will we see with ELF? You want to talk a little bit about that? And you, if you want me to show any of your, any of your graphics, just let me know. Yeah, um, well, we are do, we preparing for that, of course, yes, because once we have it done, we want to know exactly what we do and how we get data and how we analyze the data. So we now build some models and me do measurements in the lab as well in order to understand what we can detect and how we can interpret the data. So one, once we have ELF, we will... Uh, as you discussed with Jeff, that we will separate light of the planet from the star and we measure directly the light of the planet. And that we will we'll measure in different colors, what we call spectral ranges or uh, color filters, you can say, or get spectra. Um, we will not be able to get uh, very high resolution spectra because of the uh, number of photons. So we'll, we'll do some of the not so high, maybe mid uh, resolution and low resolution to get more photons, but we will collect light from this planet for a long time and with preferably very frequent measurements because what we want to detect is first rotation of the planet. So the Earth rotates around the axis and all planets in the solar system have rotation around the axis and uh, that de uh, determines day and night here in, on Earth. And the same we can see from outside, looking um, from outside on exoplanets, we'll see day and night. And, and as the planet will uh, rotate around itself, we'll see variation of the light reflected by, by the planet. So, and that reflection will vary because there are different features on the surface. There are oceans, there are continents on our planet, and there are clouds and, um, craters on and volcanoes on other planets in the solar system. So that's what we try to model. We, ta we take examples of uh, our solar system planets and the Earth itself and uh, put through that uh, measurement process, how, how the planet would rotate and orbit the star uh, during the year. And we will measure this for a long time to get lots of data and then uh, we, we test whether we can actually, what kind of features on the surface of these planets we can see. And on, on that one slide where the Earth is shown, um, uh, like uh, Earth could, could be seen from Alpha Centauri. Yes, I have it up now. Yeah. So if we have our telescope running uh, on Alpha Centauri and they look at us, you know, <laughs> they will see Earth like that. So that's what they will see. And this, uh, so one, one can already see that, oh, there is uh, continents and oceans, ice caps and forests and deserts and um, um, different features. Uh, and, and from this little spectra, we can see whether it's really desert or forest or ocean. And uh, that's what helps to identify feature on the surface. And we also do uh, measurements in the laboratory of different uh, samples which are organic and inorganic in order to get this little spectra of these measurements for different um, materials and, and creatures such as bacteria and alga and plants and some artificial also samples uh, so that we can compare uh, these colors and little spectra of our planets uh, we measure with elf and identify what, what are those features. Okay, I'm going to do just a little bit of describing here because uh, a lot of people listen to this in the audio version, and I just want to impress on people how cool this slide is. So if you took the F Exo Life Finder telescope, put it on Alpha Centauri, and looked at Earth, there's this fuzzy outline. Uh, you can actually make out, if you're familiar with the Mercator projection of the Earth, what the Earth looks like uh, with the different continents and, and things like that. But there's also, you have these little 
I think they're spectra in the white squares yes. and, yes. and they look different uh, depending on what it is you're looking at. If you're looking at a desert, for example, you get a spectral signature that looks like a, a rising line and then you get a jaggedy one at certain wavelengths. Uh, if you're looking at vegetation and this is all at certain wave at the same wavelength, it looks like from between, what is that? 400.4 yeah. microns to about 0.7 microns. Yeah, that's, uh, that's like optical infrared spectra. Mm -hmm. And uh, for vegetation, we, we see very clearly this uh, red edge, what's called, caused by, by pigments uh, like chlorophyll and carotenoids combined. Uh, that uh, photosynthetic organisms, they are tuned to absorb maximum uh, optical light and ref reflect the infrared light. And that creates this step kind of a red edge uh, feature. Oh. We do not expect that organisms will have actually chlorophyll there, uh, exactly like here, but we do expect that some photosynthetic uh, molecules will be developed in an analogous to chlorophyll. So, and some kind of analogous red edges structures will exist at different wavelengths depending on which organisms are there. So I, I just, I, I should also point out that this was a, a graph of albedo, which is uh, reflectivity versus wavelength on here. It wasn't a spectrum. Uh, it, just, it was just a reflective nature of these different uh, objects yeah. at these different wavelengths. So I misspoke earlier. I thought it was a spectrum. But the, the, um, but if you, if we were to look at with ExoLife, if we were to take ELF and look at a distance or, or one of the stars that are reasonably close by, uh, Ross 128 or whatever it happens to be, and we see something that looks like a, a albedo that's kind of going up linearly, like in that left, uh, plot, then we can kind of assume that this is a rocky planet primarily right um yes. and if you see something more like what's on the right with these with these characteristic maybe changes in albedo uh then you can see that well maybe there's some some vegetation there exactly and what is interesting is that if we do not resolve surface of a planet like uh, we can with this very frequent measurements and very precise measurements with ELF, then it's very hard to see that vegetation signal in the integrated light of the of the planet. So that uh, res by resolving the surface of a planet on, on the subcontinental structures, we can actually increase our sensitivity to uh, to vegetation or, or photosynthetic life or artificial features. Uh, the, one of the uh, other, if you jump over one slide, there is a, also a simulations for artificial structures and those can be also detected in the near space uh, um, of, the, of the exoplanet. If, if there are some artificial structures such as a uh, photovoltaic system above clouds, that can be also resolved and also identified as photovoltaic system because of the uh, high abs absorptivity in certain wavelengths. Is this the same situation as before where the, the, we're looking back at Earth from Alpha Centauri? It's, it's similar, yes. Yeah. Similar. And now techno signature, we talked about those before, but these are things that might be indicative of an artificial... Um, structure of some kind or artificial technology signature. So they're called techno signatures and elf will see them in the form of, I don't get this. I'm sorry, Svetlana. What is, what's the recovered map in the optical? I don't get what I'm yeah. looking at there. So that, uh, that is what it's like on the top, uh, is the image we assumed like, uh, input image, like the planet would have uh, structures above clouds, photovoltaic uh, panels kind of in space orbiting the planet. Oh, yeah. oh, those squares are artificial structures. Yeah, that's okay. exactly, yeah. Got it. And uh, if we observe that planet, like rotating around the axis, you know, and the different phases as it goes around the star, then we can recover that structure. So we can see this uh, structure at high, uh, very dark with high absorption uh, of the solar light, you know, and uh, so they can be different shapes. This is the most primitive shape, you can say squares, but they can be of different shape and like can build, uh, I mean, you can of course uh, practice on modeling something like uh, Star Trek uh, Enterprise, you know, mm -hmm. something like that. Yeah, great. Okay, well, that's... <laughs>
<laughs> that is, and these were simulations that were done based on the projector performance of Elf uh, as you're planning to build it. I mean, I know Jeff said you can have different yeah, configurations, it, it, but it can work for, like Jeff said, it works only for nearby bright stars up to 13 magnitude. That was my next question. Okay. So yes. nearby stars. So it, it's several thousand of stars. Uh, and of course, uh, I mean, Elf would do, uh, Colossus will cover all of them, but Elf will do several dozens of those nearby stars. Yeah. So oh. capital H asks, how far away could it detect exoplanets? Yes. And, and the answer is, is uh, it depends on how bright the star is and what the color of the star is. And so there's a range. But ELF would detect, uh, ELF would detect only, only on a handful of, of nearby stars out to five to ten light years away from us. Um, maybe a little bit more than that, depending on how much time you spent focused on it. But it's enough, it's enough objects to look at that if we were to build ELF, it would be busy uh, every night for 10 years. And, <laughs> and that, that's just on that sample. Um, the, I've, I've been watching the, the comments here. Well, uh, let me just comment but real quick. Regardless of whether you find life with it, the, the kind of information you're going to get about the planet itself is huge, I think. Just yeah, these, yeah, these albedo measurements... Like yeah, I mean, you're going to know this is definitely a primarily rocky planet. It's got lots of sand. What about, and I'll get to the questions, what about atmospheres? Can you get that, uh, Svetlana, yeah. from this? Yes, uh, atmospheres as well. You, okay. you Basically, it's the same thing. You you don't need even to resolve the atmosphere. For features, you need to resolve and collect a lot of data. For atmospheres, you can do very long exposure and you get average atmospheric composition. Okay, fair enough. So that sounds easy compared to this other stuff. Okay, yeah. um, let's see. Snuffle, Snuffleupagus, Self Snuffleton. <laughs> we already talked about that, about why it looks like that, why it has that design uh, at the beginning of the uh, Hangout. But it's just to do interferometry. Each one of those elements is its own uh, light path. Um, uh, Hans Milling, can the telescope be used to study our own solar system? Perhaps image and study Pluto some more. What do you guys think? That's harder. That's a harder thing to do for this telescope because it needs... It needs a, a, a nearly point-like object to control the wavefront. So it, it's, it's mostly uh, something that, that we would use for, for looking at planets outside the solar system. Although if we use a laser to produce a, a, a point-like uh, spot in the sky, the back reflection from the laser that is, uh, we could use it in the same way to, to study at very high resolution uh, solar system objects. But that's not uh, actually concerning the Pluto, it's interesting that the technique we now uh, explore, kind of explore for uh, studying exoplanets, uh, this uh, resolving surface structures, was also in in last century applied to Pluto first. So before Pluto was visited by uh, this New Horizons mission, the image of Pluto was obtained. Uh, like this indirectly through the same technique we want to apply for exoplanets. And if you compare this plant uh, images, which uh, we saw with the indirect imaging and then with the new horizon pictures, it's very similar. You, you what indirect this? imaging are you talking about? Uh, of Pluto? Uh, the, for Pluto, uh, for Pluto is the same, like the Pluto rotates and it has different phases, you know, as we see that uh, moving like Earth and, and Pluto seen at different angles, you know, from, from our position. So we see Pluto rotating and at different angles. And then we can collect this reflected light information from Pluto and get map of Pluto indirectly. Oh, okay. Um, uh... I don't understand what you're posting here, Kevin. Uh, Galaxia asks, how would the graph be then? What graph? Follow-up to the, James that Dugan's. Was a, that was a follow-up. Oh, I see. Uh, Jim, I see. Jim, James Dugan's question up here. On a planet orbiting a red dwarf and the vegetation is not green in color, can you still detect that yes, it's vegetation? That's a good question. On yeah. M dwarfs, uh, kind of, you know, it's again, we have to discuss this. Vegeta what is vegetation? Yeah, kind mm -hmm. of in quotation mark. This is <laughs> photosynthetic organism. Yeah, so they use uh, uh, solar light or stellar light to split water. So we, we have uh, vegetation here on Earth is dominant uh, um, uh, surface uh, life forms. 
so they use water and uh, to solar light to split water molecule. For that, you need certain energy. And that uh, energy actually is centered in the visual light, which we, we see by eye. And this is how why plants actually absorb that energy from, from the solar spectrum. So on red dwarfs, that spectrum uh, maximum, what red dwarfs radiate, is shifted to the red. That's why they, they look red, yeah? There's a uh, maximum at one micron. And in the optical range where we know that photons are good to split water, they are very few from those stars. So in, if we uh, imagine that uh, those uh, photosynthetic organisms still split water molecule, they have to absorb like everything, every single photon from that star in that optical range. So what we think is that those plants will look very, very dark. And some, there are some uh, artist rendering of those plants are basically black. And, and we know that such plants exist also on Earth, those which grow in the shadow of other plants, you know? Like we know there are like black plants, black leaves. That's because they absorb everything which falls on their surface and reflect like nothing in the optical. But still some of the light will be reflected and we believe there will be still red age which we can detect. And the answer to Galaxia's question then would be the graph would look like whatever whatever it's reflecting at, whatever way, like in the case of a black leaf, it's not reflecting anywhere. But uh, but in, let's say, you know, in the case of a red leaf or a uh, yellow leaf, it would be very reflective in those wavelengths of yellow and red. So it would, it would correspondingly peak at whatever reflectivity range those plants operate at. And you won't know that until you look. So, yeah. right. Well, of course, I, every every observation like this needs interpretation, and we always take risk of interpreting such measurements, saying, "Okay, that looks like a plant." Okay, mm -hmm. so <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah. But we will never see with that plant. So, uh, to some degree, with some probability, confirming that there could be some for this day. It's organisms also looking at that atmospheric composition and all these facts bringing together we will conclude at some point that it's possible i'm excited about just what elf can see irrespective of all the life stuff yes it's cool for that that it can find life but the the level of detail that you're going to be able to get from these planets are amazing these exoplanets are just amazing one there, there was a question in here from oh okay you already answered it kevin about tabby star uh, Tabby Star is too far away for Elf. Tabby is 1,468 light years away. So Elf won't help there. But let's say we had some kind of weir weirdness around a planet closer that was like Tabby Star. You're going to be able to figure out what it is, aren't you, Svetlana? Yes, we hope so. Yeah. We put together everything we, we know here on Earth. I mean, it's still a reference for us to guess what is there is solar system and the Earth. And as uh, the more that we get information of this kind from different exoplanets, we can actually try to see uh, see some different features which we don't see in solar systems. Okay, let's get to Ilker Barecki's question about what will ELF do differently than EELT or GMT? That's the Giant Magellan Telescope and the extremely what is the extra E for the e extremely large telescope. European uh, extremely large telescope. European yeah, large telescope. yeah, that's what it is. <laughs> um, well, that that that's again this issue that these are telescopes that are designed to see uh, far away to collect lots of light, but they're 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 in some cases much worse than ground based telescopes like like uh, the Gemini telescope at separating the light of a faint object from the light of a bright object. So because the 30 meter telescope, for example, has hundreds of these mirror segments that are not very big, um, they're less than two meters across each one of them and it has a single secondary mirror, all of the light just by the telescope structure, we say is, is scattered. And so by the time it gets to the image to undo that scattering, you have to go backwards. The ELF telescope controls the scattering at the telescope. So by the time it makes it to the image, you haven't mixed up the light from the bright star from the light of the exoplanet. So those telescopes, the ELT and the 30 meter telescope are, are good at seeing galaxies, distant galaxies, uh, collecting the light of say an isolated faint 
galaxy in the sky and allowing us to look at its spectrum or, or study its, its image. Right. But, um, but the problem of exoplanets is very different. It's, again, because the exoplanet is very, very close to this very, very bright star. And, and we have to use all the tricks we can to separate the exoplanet light from the starlight before it makes its way into the, after reflections into the detector. And that's what ELF does. Yeah. So when all of your questions about, can it see this and can it see that, you have to remember that this is a very specially, this is a special use telescope. If what you're trying to see is a very dim thing next to a very bright thing, then ELF can help you. But if you're just trying to see something like Oumuamua, which is a dim thing, not next to a bright thing, it's not going to help you much. Uh, so there, that's what you have to remember about the ELF telescope. It's designed for a, a specific problem, and that is seeing directly the light from the exoplanet and getting rid of the host star because it's in the way. It's it's billions of times brighter than what than the planet itself, and so you need to get rid of that. That's My quite quite interesting. That to see the planet, we have to get rid of the star. But to see the planet, we still need the star. <laughs> exactly, because you need its reflected light to be able to see. That's, that's kind of uh, yes, that's the rule. <laughs> <laughs> Very true. Okay, well, uh, I had a question and I forgot it. Um, so, Space TV, uh, looking at dim things like comets or objects like Oumuamua, not necessarily unless it's ne near something. Uh-oh. We just lost Hawaii. Hawaii went off. I hope it's okay. Hawaii went off. You're in Europe, right, uh, Svetlana? <laughs> Here. Okay. Yes, there is one question that okay. uh, one would expect from Grivas. Yeah, one uh -huh. would expect plants to operate in the range of EM spectrum at which their star gives off the greatest amount of energy. That's totally true. Uh, we do expect that. Yes, but still, I want to emphasize that if they operate on water, this which which we also expect that this is also one of the most abundant molecules in the universe, uh, then they have to split water or something else they have to split the molecule uh, to get the uh, to get the carbohydrates uh, fixed in their bodies so and that requires uh, particular energy and that not all uh, parts of electromagnetic spectrum where the star is maximum gives that enough of that energy so th there are two options either they have less energy and they adapt to this or they invent completely new mechanism that we don't know yet uh, to use some, uh, some people suggest it could be some multi-photon step that you kind of accumulate energy to split that molecule. So, and it's possible that life is so creative, it created so many, uh, such a diversity on, on earth of creatures that uh, life will invent a mechanism of splitting, say, water molecule in a different way than here, using the photons of lower energy than we have from the sun. And it's possibly that on M dwarfs, on red dwarfs, we discover life which invented that mechanism. Great. Okay. Well, I think we better stop there because we are out of time, but I want to thank okay. everybody. If you guys go to planets.life, check out their website and uh, figures, spread the word on this telescope, folks, because it is an important work they're trying to get done. I think it's an amazing uh, effort and I want to see this thing get built. So help these guys out uh, and, and, and try to get involved in whatever you, way you can. Spread the word that this is out there and that these people are uh, we're trying to build an amazing uh, instrument that would there was a question about can we build this around the world of course you can uh we, it's all a matter of funding and so we need to get this thing funded and built so svetlana thank you for taking time out i know it's late where you are so thank you and i'll i would thank uh, jeff and kevin but i think they got disconnected so i'm going to um stop there and thank you all so much for watching next week i'll be back with carol christian where we're going to record uh our deep astronomy podcast episode and we'll take some questions at that time and then we'll have another telescope talk pro later Later. So uh, in the third week of the month. So uh, thank you all so much. And again, uh, thank you. <laughs> thank you for listening. And as always, keep looking up.